Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all said within and beyond the West End. Today's episode began as an ordinary morning for three police officers going about their regular duties. And what started as a simple stop and search on a West London street for what would have been a very minor traffic offence led to the brutal and senseless executions of three good men. Murder Mile is researched using the original police files. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details and as a dramatisation of the real events it may also feature loud and realistic sounds so that no matter where you listen to this podcast you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 90, The Wormwood Scrubs Police Massacre. Today, I'm standing on Braybrook Street in East Acton, W12. Two stops south of the death of eight-year-old Peter Buckingham, Three roads northeast of the home of Vincent Carey's killers. Three streets north of the Shepherd's Bush police station, where the murder of Katerina Konyeva ended and this story began. And four stops west of Britain's most prominent pathologist, whose manipulation of forensic evidence may have led to an innocent man being hanged. Coming soon to Murder Mile. This side of East Acton is best described as vague. It's little more than a mishmash of mismatched houses and flats on a grey landscape wedged between a crisscross of train tracks, a canal, the A40 flyover, construction sites, cranes, drains, trucks, buses and the vapour trails of planes. So if you enjoy trees, grass and breathing, tough titties. But if you live on a diet of energy drinks, crisps, weed and court summonses, if you love inhaling exhaust fumes, swallowing flies and wiping a thick soot off your forehead as you dream of developing a terminal lung disease whilst being mugged and stabbed with a hospital, a prison and a cemetery nearby, East Acton is the place for you. This message is not endorsed by the East Acton Tourist Board. In contrast to that, as part of the Old Oak Estate, Braybrook Street feels like it's lost in a time warp. As a series of two-storey brown brick terraced houses on one side of the street, with wooden gates, big chimneys and neat privet hedges, it looks homely but a bit old-fashioned. In front, on some scrubland known as Wormwood Scrubs, you half expect to see girls in miniskirts playing hopscotch, and beside the infamous prison at the end of the street, boys playing football and dreaming of being Bobby Charlton. And although it looks pleasant enough, the street is still haunted by the horrors of that day. As it was here, on Friday the 12th of August 1966, that the lives of three brave men would be taken. And although the infamous Wormwood Scrubs police massacre would cause a national outrage, The incident itself had started over something so trivial. Friday the 12th of August 1966 was an ordinary day for three coppers assigned to Shepherd's Bush Police Station. They were Detective Sergeant Head, Temporary Detective Constable Wormwell and Police Constable Fox. Detective Sergeant Christopher Tippett Head was one of four children to a widowed mother. Born to be a copper, age 17, he enlisted as a cadet. At 19, he did his national service in the RAF police. At 23, he joined the Met Police and was posted to Fulham. And in 1964, Chris was promoted to Detective Sergeant 
in the Criminal Investigation Department, known as CID. He was tall, calm, and reliable. Being single, he was married to his job. But after 13 years of service, although he was only 30, he was seen as a father figure to the new recruits. At 7.30 a.m. that morning, as part of his routine, D.S. Head left his accommodation at Ravens Court House and walked one mile north to Shepherd's Bush Police Station. Police Constable Geoffrey Roger Fox, 41 years old, had been a local bobby in the bush for the last 16 years. He knew the beat, the people and the places. Jeff had been happily married to his wife Marjorie for two decades. They lived in a modest council flat in North Holt, and together they raised a family. Two teenage kids, Anne and Paul, and two-year-old Mandy. As a change of job, PC Fox had been assigned to a Q car, as driver of an unmarked police car assigned to CID, which patrolled Acton, Shepherd's Bush, and Hammersmith. That morning, as per usual, he kissed his wife and kids goodbye and drove the 40-minute journey to work in rush hour traffic. And temporary Detective Constable David Stanley Wormwell, 25 years old, young, smart and fresh-faced. Raised by his father and grandfather, David studied engineering at London Polytechnic. And having recently been assigned to F Division, Although he had only been with the force for three years, he was quickly rising through the ranks with a promising career ahead. He had been married to his wife Gillian for four years, and they had two young children, three-year-old Dane and eight-month-old Melanie. At 7.15am, he too kissed his wife and babies goodbye, pulled out of their home on East Acton Lane, and trundled his green VW Beetle to the Shepherd's Bush Police Station. So far, it was the start of an unremarkable day. At 8 a.m., the three officers started their shift by performing a handover with the night patrol. DS had inspected the incident reports. DC Wormwell read the RT log, a record of the unit's radio transmissions, and the stop book, a logbook of every person they had questioned. Whilst PC Fox examined the car, a blue Triumph 2000 automatic, which was fast, nippy and reliable. Even if the Borg Warner gearbox was notoriously temperamental and took a second to shift it from neutral to reverse to drive. At 9am, with PC Fox driving the unmarked police car, DS Wormwell operating the radio and DS head in the back, as the three men in civilian suits pulled their anonymous little car out of the back of Shepherd's Bush Police Station, it blended in seamlessly with the traffic on Uxbridge Road. Their call sign was Foxtrot 11. Their role? To patrol the area freely, to identify anything suspicious, and to intervene where necessary. But apart from a few drunks, domestics, and driving offences, the morning was uneventful. At 12.30pm, they returned to the station, filled in their paperwork, and even though the unit had been together just a few weeks, the three colleagues popped out for a usual spot of lunch at the Beaumont Arms pub on the corner of Wood Lane. At 2pm, they returned for the last three hours of their shift. And that's it. They had no enemies, no grudges and no debts. They weren't corrupt, brutal or on the take. They didn't see, hear or sense anything which was out of the ordinary. And yet, just one hour later, all three men were shot dead. The barbaric slaughter of D.S. Head DC Wormwell and PC Fox sent shockwaves of revulsion through the British establishment and society. So sickened were the people 
they called for Parliament to bring back the death penalty, just one year after it had been abolished. As this wasn't just a shooting, this was the cold-blooded execution of three unarmed men. But their killers didn't intend it to be. Friday the 12th of August 1966 was an ordinary day for three criminals in Shepherd's Bush. They were Jack Whitney, John Duddy and Harry Roberts. John Edward Whitney, known as Jack, was an only child who was abandoned by his father and following the death of his mother lived an unhappy life in several foster homes. Age 17, he joined the army. But four years later, he was court-martialed for desertion and sentenced to 12 months at Colchester Barracks, where he escaped and he would remain on the run until his arrest. He had three known aliases, he was married for six years and earned a few bob as a plumber and a labourer. He was 36 years old, 5 foot 9 tall, skinny, with receding hair, two missing teeth, a dimpled chin, lobeless ears, and he was described as looking a bit gormless. That day, Jack Whitney was at a loss, as he was too afraid to go home and tell his wife that he had lost his job. John Duddy, known as Jock, had a poor but happy childhood as the sixth of eleven children to a housewife mother and a policeman father. He was raised and educated well, but age 16, he was sent to Borstal for burglary and later to prison for theft. Age 21, he did his army national service in Malaya and Suez, but being demobbed, he found it difficult to hold down a regular job and committed several robberies with Harry Roberts. Six weeks before the murders, whilst working as a truck driver, his brakes failed, the lorry crashed, and he was unable to return to work or to drive. John Duddy was 38 years old, 5 foot 7 tall and stocky, with bushy eyebrows, grey wavy hair and dirty teeth. He was heavily tattooed and had a skull with the words true death on his right arm. As his debts mounted, he had been drinking heavily and just three weeks prior, his wife of 18 years had walked out on him. And Harry Roberts, a career criminal who was born in Essex, raised in London and learned to be a petty thief by seeing his mum steal black market goods during wartime rationing. With a deep-seated hatred of the police and a disdain for other people, as a youth he served 19 months in Borstal for attacking a shopkeeper with an iron bar. In the army, he often bragged about the enemy soldiers he had shot dead and said here he had got a taste for executing prisoners of war. Being demobbed, he robbed bookmakers, post offices and banks. And in 1959, he was sentenced to seven years for robbery. So violent was this assault, for the judge warned him, next time, it'll be the rope. Harry Roberts was 30 years old, 5 foot 10, with brown wavy hair, thick arched eyebrows, and several scars on his eyelid, cheek and left thumb. One month before the murders, he had just been released from prison. So far, this too was the start of an unremarkable day. At 8am, Whitney and Roberts called at Duddy's home at 142 Wimington Road in Paddington. The plan was simple. Between 8am and 6pm, a dark blue 1966 Ford Corsair was parked up near East Acton Tube Station. Having put a set of identical false plates on a similar looking car nearby, by the time the police realised that the car they had found wasn't the missing one, the gang and the stolen Ford Corsair would be long gone. But their day started badly and only got worse. Firstly, their getaway car, a black Daimler owned by Harry Roberts, was a danger to drive, 
as the brake pads were shot. Secondly, the only working car they had left was Jack Whitney's standard vanguard, a small post-war estate which was rusty, small and slow. It had a suspiciously bad paint job, being some kind of blue but with white bits peeping through, and being unreliable. The tyre squealed round corners, the chassis thumped over small bumps, and even on the smoothest of roads, the exhaust backfired and rattled. At 9.45am, with Whitney driving, Roberts riding shotgun, and Duddy in the back, having stashed in the footwell a brown canvas bag containing overalls, false plates, and three revolvers, a 38 caliber Enfield, a 38 Colt Special and a 9mm Luger. They set off in search of another blue Ford Corsair. Only to encounter a third problem. They couldn't find another blue Ford Corsair. So having wasted a full three hours trawling the back streets of West London, it wasn't until 1pm that they found a not quite new, not quite blue, almost Ford Corsair look-alike, which would have to do. Except that led to a fourth problem. Whitney, the supposed locksmith, couldn't break into the spare Corsair, and as he jiggled a wire coat hanger to try and trip the lock's tumblers, the wire broke and wedged in the keyhole. Losing his shit, Roberts erupted with a volley of spit, spite and curse words. And being so fed up with the whole caper, he ordered his bungling bandits back into the van and they headed to the Clay Pigeon pub in Eastcote for a few pints and a game of darts to calm his temper. That was their plan. It was as crappy as their rusty squeaky little van. And yet, just one hour later, they would shoot three innocent an unarmed policeman to death. The afternoon had been as uneventful as the morning for the crew of Foxtrot 1-1, as their blue unmarked Q car patrolled the back streets of Shepherd's Bush and East Acton. Except for the rumble of trucks, the squawk of birds, and the squeal of excitable kids playing, the streets were predictably quiet. At 3.12pm, having driven north of Old Oak Road and instinctively decided to inspect a recent car theft hotspot, they indicated right, and after an awkward pause, as the gearbox shifted from neutral to drive, with a slow but reluctant click, the blue Triumph 2000 turned northeast onto Erkenwald Street. Their eyes and ears finally tuned to the sights and sounds of anything suspicious. Cruising by the residential houses of the old Oak Estate, as they passed East Acton Tube Station, 300 feet ahead, they spotted a vehicle driving at an unusually sedate pace, as the silhouettes of its three occupants looked from side to side, like they were seeking someone or something. Keeping the anonymous cue car at a distance, the three officers watched as the battered old van continued north towards Wormwood Scrubs Prison and turned west onto Braybrook Street. Suspicions were raised by the unroadworthy vehicle. So having made the decision to stop and search, as PC Fox drew the cue car alongside the van, with the flash of his police ID, Diaz Head signalled the van's driver to pull over. With the van stopped and its engine dead, in the stop book, DC Womwell wrote the date, Friday the 12th of August 1966, the time, 3.15pm, the location, outside of 57 Braybrook Street, and the vehicle's description, a blue standard Vanguard, registration plate, PGT 726. In line with protocol, should the suspects try to flee, as DC Womwell and DC Head exited the Q car, P. 
PC Fox repositioned the Triumph ahead of the suspect vehicle and kept the engine running. DS Head stood on the curb, examining the van's contents and occupants, and having shown his police ID, DC Wanwell spoke to the driver. Good afternoon, sir. Is this your car? Jack Whitney was polite and cooperative. With his van being a bit of a dog, he knew not to be a smart ass with the copper, and that if he admitted to his faults and paid the fine, he could probably go about his day. To be honest, as this was just a traffic stop, Jack was less worried about the few points on his license, and more worried about how he would tell his wife that once again, he had lost his job. And as DS head peeped in through the windows, in the back seat, John Duddy sat all still and silent, as in the passenger seat, Harry Roberts shifted uncomfortably, a brown canvas bag dumped by his feet. DS head asked, Sir, what's in the bag? But Harry Roberts ignored him. This was not going to be a good day for Jack Whitney. Not only was he jobless, potless, and about to have his ear chewed off by his missus, but his vehicle wasn't legal. And although he pleaded with the fresh-faced officer to give him some time to sort it out, the van was uninsured, untaxed, and unroadworthy. By the passenger's side door, DS Head knocked on the glass and repeated, Sir, I asked you, what's in the bag? To which Roberts huffed, yanked it open, and flashed a set of dirty overalls, but nothing else. Again, Whitney pleaded further, throwing himself at the young officer's mercy, and as DC Wormwell examined the driver's license for his previous motoring offences, Jack knew that his fate was in the hands of this policeman. DS Head tried the passenger side door. It was locked. He knocked louder. Sir, open this door. Roberts froze. He knew the false license plates couldn't be pinned on a crime, and although it was still legal to carry a gun, not owning a firearms license and being an ex-convict who was still on parole, he risked being sent back to prison. Harry seethed. He hated coppers, despised the filth, and resented the bully boys in blue who told him what to do. And rather than just accept the fact that his crappy life was all because he was a shitty thief, with a bad attitude, a foul temper, and a loose fuse. He was furious at the pigs for everything he had ever done wrong. And although this brief moment amounted to nothing more than a minor traffic violation, Sir, I need you to show me that bag. As his fingers fumbled inside, his blood boiled, his temper rose, and his patience snapped. As DC Wormwell leaned on the driver's side window, listening to Whitney's plea, Roberts pointed a 9mm Luger at the startled officer's face, and from point-blank range, a bullet tore through his left eye, his brain, and as it exploded out the back of his skull, the second his head hit the road, he was dead. Terrified, unarmed, and fleeing with his hands held high, as DS head ran, a shot hit him squarely in the back. The force of it spun him 90 degrees, and as a stocky cop thudded onto the hard tarmac, Roberts chased him down as the defenseless officer lay bleeding in the road, barely hidden by the front of the cue car. From a few feet away, aiming at his face, Roberts fired again, but the gun jammed. Profusely bleeding from a collapsed lung and bullet wounds to both sides of his torso, even as his chest filled with blood, DS Head seized the opportunity, grabbed Harry Roberts' legs and kicked out wildly, booting Roberts in the face and splitting his lip. A second later, as the coward once again took aim at the injured officer's face. DS Head screamed, and Roberts fired. 
but again the gun jammed. With one officer dead and one officer dying, as Harry Roberts struggled with the faulty gun, armed with nothing but a useless truncheon, PC Fox threw the Triumph into reverse to back up and try and run Roberts over. But the gearbox took an interminably long second to shift from neutral to reverse. Roberts shouted, Daddy, get here, come on! But as PC Fox began to reverse, in the van's back seat, Duddy was frozen in horror as Robert stood over the paralysed officer, jiggling the jammed gun, just seconds from a senseless execution. Again he screamed, Daddy, fuck's sake, get the driver! Grabbing a 38 Enfield from the bag, Duddy ran to the reversing cue car and fired. The first shot smashed the passenger's side window and as the bullet whizzed by PC Fox's chin, it shattered the quarter light and embedded in the driver's door. But the officer was unhurt. As PC Fox struggled to shift the Triumph from reverse to neutral, from the front, Duddy fired again, blasting a football-sized hole in the windscreen, which exploded sharp shards of glass in PC Fox's face. But again, he was unhurt. Suddenly, with a solid click, the gearbox shifted from neutral to drive, and as Robert stood a few feet from the car's bonnet, jiggling his jammed gun as the dying officer lay at his feet. As PC Fox stamped on the accelerator, through the shattered side window, Duddy dived headfirst into the cue car, and within an inch of the officer's eyes, shot PC Fox in the face. At that moment, DS Head was still alive, PC Fox was dead, and the car he was in was out of control. As it jolted forward, the Triumph only clipped Roberts. But lying helpless in the road, the speeding car slammed into DS Head, wedged his body under its steel chassis, and dragged the officer, alive and conscious, several yards down Braybrook Street. And with the engine revving, the hot exhaust burning into his skin, and the right rear wheel spinning wildly, as the one-ton vehicle pinned the officer under its axle, the cue car finally came to a halt. But by then, having dashed back into their van, the cowards had fled, and three good men were dead. Having gone into hiding, John Edward Whitney, John Duddy and Harry Morris Roberts were swiftly caught and arrested. The trial was held at the Old Bailey on the 12th of December 1966, just three months later. After less than 30 minutes deliberation, a unanimous jury found them all guilty of firearms offences, intent to resist arrest and three counts of murder. The judge later stated, You have been justly convicted of what is perhaps the most heinous crime to have been committed in this country for a generation. I think it is unlikely that any Home Secretary in the future will ever see fit to show you any mercy by releasing you on license. Therefore, I recommend you serve at least 30 years before parole is considered. And although Roberts was warned, Next time, it'll be the rope. With the death penalty having been abolished, unlike his victims, he escaped with his life. In 1981, John Duddy died in Parkhurst. In 1991, having been released six years earlier on license, Jack Whitney was found beaten to death in his Bristol flat. And having shown no remorse for his actions, the officers, or their grieving families, even though he had occupied his time inside by earning a pathetic pittance of his so-called notoriety by selling signed autographs of himself and painting sickening artwork of the massacre. On the 11th of November 2014, Roberts was released. 
the brutal executions of Detective Sergeant Christopher Head, Detective Constable David Wormwell, and Police Constable Geoffrey Fox are remembered to this day, still mourned by their families, and on the 50th anniversary of their murders, a memorial stone was placed on the site of the Wormwood Scrubs Police Massacre, in memory of three good men who were killed over something trivial. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Don't forget, after a short gap, but hopefully an advert, but probably a short gap, soon I shall be expelling air from my lungs and vibrating my voice box in a way which some people say is amusing. But I shall leave that up to you. Before that, a big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Dawn Long, Erica Sinerva, Joe DeVries, Lucy Barr, Jason Bright, and Ami Amri. I thank you all, and I hope you got your goodies. And also, a hello to everyone who listens to Murder Mile. I hope you are all safe, well, and full of tea and cake. Murder Mile was researched, written, and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult with No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. Oh, oh dear. Oh, that screwed up my voice, that did. Oh, that hurt, that one did. Too many, too many cock, too many cockneys. Geezer, oh, geezer, my geezer, my cockney geezer. Too much that. God, my throat really killed on that one. Right, let's open some windows, let's let some light in. Oh dear, let some air in. Oh, go make a cup of tea. Hello, everyone. Extra mile time. Uh, we're here again. Here we are. Uh, doing some, gonna do some waffling. Uh, I'm gonna make a cup of tea in a bit. Gonna open some windows. Oh, exciting! He's gonna open some windows. Oh, I wonder what's outside. Oh, will it be coots? Will it be swans? Will it? Oh, oh, the excitement. Will it be someone walking past coffin? Probably. Will it be drug dealers? Probably. This is one thing I've noticed that um, even though a loads of businesses are shut down, drug dealers seem to be doing okay seem to be going well there's a lot of people walking along the canal getting stoned all the time they don't seem to be doing a lot so the drug dealers seem to be doing fine uh everyone else is struggling drug dealers are doing okay uh right let's just make a quick cup of tea <laughs> oh. Oh, door open windows oh, sun streaming in just see how much water i've got oh, a bit of spillage there we go, pop that in there. Uh, what shall I have? Oh no, let's have let's have some hot Robinson's barley water. Oh yummy. It's exciting. Not gonna have a tea, gonna have a hot Robinson's barley water. Does my life get any more exciting than that? No, it does not. Sadly, no cake today. No, I'm not on a diet. It's just uh, trying to get a lot of things done at the moment and uh, uh, so I was trying to get this episode written because I was desperate to record this today it's Tuesday this is like nine days before you get this so I've recorded this like nine days prior I was pushing ahead and I was like right let's get loads of stuff done and I thought right after this because I'm out of food I'll go to the supermarket but I forgot double bank holiday isn't it it was we had the good Friday then it was Saturday Sunday then it, then it was Easter Monday yesterday and I forgot so I got to the supermarket about seven o'clock I was like no it's shut so no cake no cake I know no cake no cake no biscuits no biscuits no cake will I survive I don't know probably not oh dear <coughs> um so still in the same place can't move the boat which is fine got all my stuff on board which is good supermarket nearby I'm next to a big park so I can have a nice big walk and get my bit of exercise while we still can. 
God knows what's going to happen if we go into full lockdown. And just like in France, where they say you can't exercise outside, I think I don't know whether it's Paris or France, but they said you can't go outside to do your exercising or something like that. I may have misread that, but uh, yeah, God, what's going to happen for those of us who don't have a garden? That's going to be a pain in the ass. All right for rich people and their big houses. For those, the rest of us who don't have a garden, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Right, let's plough on. Let's do some stuff before the kettle boils. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this before. A big thank you to everyone who voted. Uh, uh, remember the, I mentioned about the link that a podcast magazine were doing a hot 50 podcast. Whoa. And thank you to everyone who voted for that. That was really exciting. We managed to get up to number three, which is brilliant. So uh, that's really exciting. Uh, that was great. That was there, there were so many big podcasts under us and kind of languishing at the bottom and it was like yeah mid digit to them yeah uh, but you know w- number three that was fantastic so thank you to everyone who voted on that uh it really did i think it really helps you know getting these mentions in magazines and things like that and blogs elsewhere really does help because do you know when 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 these big magazines do these uh reviews of like not reviews but they go oh what is the top 10 uh podcasts of the year they're not researching it they're not checking it themselves they're just looking at what all the other magazines are doing and they're just copying that they're cut and pasting really that's all it is so but it cut, because the big podcasters have marketing teams and we don't have that it, this kind of really helps so oh right i would say tea's up but it's not it's robinson's barley water there we go Oh, there you go. Hot orange cordial. Mixing it up a bit today. That's nice. Hot orange cordial. And sometimes a nice nice cup of Oxo can be nice in the afternoons. Or a cup of Oxo with uh, some uh, uh, splashes of uh, chilli sauce in there as well. Ooh, lovely. Ooh, right. Um, just to say, to keep you all occupied, uh, if you're on my um, Murder Mile, uh, discussion group on Facebook, I've got a couple of pages on there, all my social media. I've been pumping out some uh, pumping. Uh, I've been pumping out some uh, quizzes for everyone, kind of murder style quizzes, serial killer stuff like that. Put them out on uh, all, all the social media sites. But what I've done now is I've put them on my merch page on the uh, Murder Mile eShop. They're all free. You don't need to subscribe. You don't need to put in any details. All it really asks for is an email address just so it can email it to you. It's really simple. Go on there, put in your details and uh, you can download it as many times as you want. There's four quizzes on there at the moment. All good fun. Kind of, uh, you know, pictures of serial killers' houses and you've got to guess which one it is. Pictures of their cars, pictures of their eyes and there's one that I call Serial Killer Cluedo as well. That's on there and that's in there with all the uh murder mile ringtones and all the free stuff so it's all on there and i'll put if i can remember i'll put a link in the show notes i'll probably forget but it is on the merch page it's just marked free quizzes nice and simple (sighs) uh what's going on life's plodding on just going going through uh everything at the moment mum's funeral next week so that's all getting ready for that doing all the legal rubbish that comes with uh bereavements uh gonna doing lots of e-drinks at the moment with friends which is really good it's quite interesting kind of people who i normally wouldn't call all of a sudden i'm calling and having nice long chats with them and we're doing some online quizzes that's all good so uh yeah (laughs) quite interesting and i even have a drink this week although by the time you listen to this this would be last week uh i'm having a uh, an e-drink with police constable arsenal guinness well, I'm sure he will have some some Guinnesses ready. <laughs> uh, looking forward to that. Uh, and also, even though we're all in lockdown, um, because you don't need to worry, I did all of my research in December, January and February. So that's all the research for all these episodes a year ahead. So I'm way ahead of the game, which is great. Uh, and also, I did a lot of the location videos and photos in advance as well. Not all of them, but I did a big chunk of them. Uh so I'm rejigging the episodes around just to accommodate that. So, uh, you know, so the episodes that go out do have videos with them. But they're all different. All the episodes are nice and different. So that'll be good. Whew, right. Out of breath. Right. I'm whizzing a little bit here because I, l- I missed out a big chunk out of uh, this episode. 
So let's do the questions, then I'll go into the bit I missed deliberately, and then we'll go back to the uh, questions and answers. Right, get ready. Whew, question and answer time. Slurp. Ooh, hot orange juice. Mm -hmm. Or hot orange cordial. Right, question number one. What was the call sign of the cue car that the officers drove? Mm. Question number two. What was the name of the pub the police went to for lunch? Mm, I used to go there quite a lot. Question number three. What pub did the criminals go to? Question number four. What type of car did the criminals hope to steal? You can just do make, you can do year, and you can do colour if you like. All good. Question five. All three criminals served in the army in which country? I.e. obviously they served in Britain, but where did they go overseas? Uh, all three of them served in the same country. Um, only one of them served in two countries, but which... Which country did all three of them served in? That'll make sense at the end. Duddy died. I loved saying that. <laughs> Duddy, Duddy died in which prison? Not not happy that he died. It's just Duddy died. Duddy died is fun to say. Duddy died in which prison? Question seven. Oh, that was question six in case I didn't say that. Question seven. Uh, oh, and, and, and as always, if any of these questions are missing, that's because I've removed it from here because I've probably edited that bit, bit out of the episode just, just for time, you know, the sake of speed. Question seven. Name the type of gearbox used in the Triumph 2000. That was the uh, blue uh, Q car. I only mentioned it twice. Oh, did you remember it, though? Uh, question eight. The criminals drove what type of van two-parter and what car couldn't they drive as the brakes were shot question nine let's hope this is still in the episode it probably might not be what tattoo did john duddy have on his right arm oh i said it then uh question 10 as always i'll probably cock it up by mentioning some of these answers in the thing i'm about to say question 10 name the three guns that the uh, criminals used right let's remember to go back to that shortly right <coughs> um this was an interesting case i already knew about this case way in advance but this is one of those stories that unfortunately uh, has been mistold so many times especially by the tabloid newspapers and especially by the dipshits who tend to write these bullshit books about gangsters oh who always glorifying this kind of bullshit they always get it wrong and they always misinterpret it in a way that kind of makes the gangsters sound great but as you know all gangsters are bellens they're the kind of people who should never be hero worshipped they have a tendency as we've seen to take credit for any of any crimes that are out there even if they've never committed them they always love to pretend that they're more successful they've got this romantic idea that they're kind of like do you know like uh tony montana in uh, uh scarface and they're sitting there in their big mansions and uh, with a big pile of cocaine going say hello to my little friend they, they they love to pretend that that's how they live but when you really look into their lives it's pretty sad pretty pathetic they're quite shallow people they're worth nothing they love the notoriety which is why you always get these books by by ghost written by gangsters who uh, aren't i great and they love talking about all these crimes that they committed but there's no proof for them and they're happy to say yeah i did it but they won't go to they won't go to the courts and say okay lock me up and so i serve time for that to prove that i did it they will waffle about how they did it but there's no evidence that they did it most of the time it's just bullshit oh they're just the most shallow pathetic people ever and although as i said you know they like to believe that they live like tony montana in a mansion you know full well that the best that they, they're going to be living in a little shitty little flat somewhere living probably off disability benefits or whatever they can con and at best they're going to be living in a shitty to uh, a shitty tumble down flat you know in the costa del sol probably dying of skin cancer uh gangsters really 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 find them really pointless i really do Ugh. anyway 
Uh, um, a couple of statements. Harry Roberts gave a statement. I'm not going to do his voice because I can't be asked. He said, uh, I shot the two policemen on that Friday afternoon and it was Duddy who shot the driver. Well, at least he was honest about that. Uh, I don't know what we were doing up there at the Scrubs. Bullshit. Uh, we were going to nick a car, but not that particular day. We had the plates in Jack's van. We were going to rib the rent collector. Uh, uh, sorry, that says rib. That probably meant Rob. We're going to have a rib. They're going to rib him. They're going to go, he, he, he. They're going to tell him, tell him some really funny jokes uh, and nudge him in the ribs. Uh, we, we were going to rob the rent collector. Uh, when the police car pulled us and the officers came back to us, I thought they were going to find the guns in the car. So I shot the officer who was talking to Jack. Then I shot the one who was talking to Jock. Uh, I got out of the car as the officer ran towards the police and shot him. Jock got out of the car. That Jock would be duddy uh, out of the car and went to the police car and shot the driver. I'll explain about the escape shortly. Duddy later said, I didn't mean to kill him, i.e. the driver. I wanted quick money, the easy way. I am a fool. I used to work as a driver up until six weeks ago, but Roberts and Whitney you, used to organise the raids and we went, we went on and it was easy. Uh, there's lots of evidence at the scene obviously um, lots of bullet holes uh, a one a spent Luger cartridge casing outside Braybrook, uh, 57 Braybrook Street by the fence two by the curb outside number 59 and one under uh, DC Wormwell's body a 38 calibre bullet was found inside the police car a fragment of another bullet was found 120 feet away uh, da, 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 da. uh obviously there were several witnesses who saw the scene you got the girls in the street uh who were playing hopscotch you saw um i think there's a guy called robert newman i believe that was he was like a 10 year old kid he saw it all he was standing there playing football and the guys in the van they worked for uh the danish baking company they were having a snooze they saw it all i'll put uh, get to that very shortly uh, at the autopsy, which is done at Hammersmith Mortuary by Dr. Tear, uh, DS Head uh, died of hemorrhage from bullet wound to the chest. He had a bullet wound uh, in his back in the middle and an exit hole in his chest. His un other injuries included abrasions to the legs, fractures to the thighs, burns across his buttocks caused by being dragged under the car and by the heat of the exhaust. Um, Constable Fox, the driver, had an entry hole in his left of his temp entry hole in the left of his temple, an exit hole in the right of his temple, and was shot in the face at point blank range. DC Wonwell was shot just slightly below the left eye with an exit wound at the back of the head, and it is said that he died instantly. Right, this is the bit I missed out. Um, I was going to do the whole. I decided with this one, obviously, not to do a kind of soup to nuts story where we start with their birth and follow one person along. Because there's six people, I thought, let's get into it. Let's do mug shots at the start. Then let's just tell the story of the day. That was my idea in the end. Let's not go into the whole escape and stuff like that. Although it is really interesting. So, whew, this bit is interesting. But I, I just thought, let's just... Mm. Oh, cordial. Oh, hot, hot going down. Um... I thought, let's just tell the story of the day and then I'll, I'll save the escape for afterwards, even though it's quite exciting. So, uh, the three criminals got back in their little shitty little van. They drove back down Old Oak Road to Hammersmith over Battersea Bridge. Uh, unfortunately, it's there. This is what a bunch of fuckwits they were. Ran out of fuel, right? Didn't bother to check in advance. Uh, so they had to push the van to a garage and get a gallon of fuel. From there, they drove to Vauxhall Bridge to the Arches, uh, which was a place that they'd a kind of a lockup that they'd already got. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Whitney, uh, Jack Whitney, it was his. He parked it in the garage. If you go, if you're on my Patreon site, you'll see pictures of the um, the van itself in the lockup as the police found out. Uh, Duddy uh, got home after the sheet Duddy said after the shooting I went home and I was feeling sick with the whole business and I had to get my kids their tea as you can remember his wife had actually left him about three weeks before uh, Whitney parked up the car in the in the um, in the garage 
Uh, Whitney and Roberts walked to Westminster Bridge, caught a bus, got off at Euston Road, uh, and then went to a cafe for a couple of minutes for a, a nice cup of tea, as you do. Then went back to Duddy's flat. E- now, uh, as they were pulling in to uh, these arches, uh, a lady actually saw them, a lady called uh, Elizabeth Pantlin. She was uh, on a balcony on a fourth floor flat just overlooking the railway arches. And she said between 2 p.m. and 2.30, a blue van drove into the yard, not fast, but drove into the wall of the arches. Yes, Jack Whitney, being such a fuckwit, drove into the wall of the arches. It banged the side of the van. Uh, uh, She said the driver got out of the van five minutes later, locked up the garages and disappeared. And her description exactly matches uh, John... uh, It says Duddy. I think it... I think they mean Whitney here yeah they should have meant Whitney because he was the one that was driving uh it was definitely the exact van same registration plate and it had been sprayed a kind of a medium blue with a a lot of shitty white shining underneath Uh, obviously this story was pretty big news they knew exactly who it was they'd already written down who the uh the, the the van who the van belonged to uh they'd already got descriptions of the men that went into the papers so it started circulating on the news and on the radio it was a really big story especially considering the fact that the the moore's murderers trial had already started and would finish after this so this was mid moore's mid moore's murderers trial uh that night after the murder uh about 9 p.m uh whitney was seen by officers at his own home this is at 10 fernhead road uh w9 so that's uh that'd be not too far from kind of notting hill area westbourne grove um detective inspector stevenson questioned him he was with his wife di stevenson don't forget this is jack whitney he's uh, he's terrified that his wife is going to find out that he's lost his job um she's actually about 10 to 15 years older than him and she's a little bit He's a little henpecked. He's a little bit henpecked. She's a little bit frightening. But you'll see that here anyway. Um, uh, Jack Whitney was with his wife. D.I. Stevenson uh, asked him about his blue standard Vanguard van. Registration plate, blah, blah, blah. He said, is this yours? Whitney said, uh, we've, we've just seen it on the telly about the coppers being shot. Wife asked, that can't be our car. Where is it? It's, where is it? dead that's not uh. oh oh where is it uh whitney said i sold it today wife said you didn't tell me that the di said who did you sell it to whitney uh told an elaborate story which was clearly false only to, only to be contradicted by his wife who said you said you were at work <laughs> obviously he he hadn't told her that he'd lost his job whitney was agitated sweat sweating and trembling according to the police Whitney was escorted to Harrow Road Police Station, where Reg Christie used to work. Mm. Uh, his wife, uh, uh, his wife begged him to tell the truth. Uh, Jack Whitney asked for a solicitor. At eleven thirty p.m. that same night, Whitney was taken to Harrow Road Police Station. Then at midnight to the Shepherd's Bush Police Station. It's obviously that's uh, the bigger police station. Uh, Harrow Road is just kind of like a small satellite unit. Uh, where Whitney was detained. Detective Sergeant James Begg with DCI Henley said, do you wish to put into writing the details of your movements yesterday? Because obviously this is post midnight now. Uh, Whitney said, yes, I've got nothing to hide. He wrote down the whole transcript of what happened. Um, And this was used in court, but it it, it proved that Whitney, little fart there, sorry about that, uh, was a liar. Um... Although Whitney did say to his police escort as he was being driven to the police station, uh, how are the wives of the policemen who got killed? I cannot bear to think about the kids they had. Roberts and Duddy must have been mad. Obviously, don't forget, Whitney didn't shoot any of them. He was the, he was the guy who was sitting in the car driving, saying, do you know, oh, please let me off, officer. I need to, my insurance and stuff like that. He didn't kill anyone, but he was tried as a murderer. Uh, Whitney also named uh, Roberts and Duddy as his as his accomplices. Uh, on the fifteenth of August, so just three days later, Whitney was charged with the murder of two officers. Uh, although he didn't fire any shots, he ref- at that point he refused to give names because he was worried about the safety of his wife and kids. 
Detective Inspector Chitty, good name, uh, gives him his, his insurance, and after that point, Whitney gave a full confession. The next day, Saturday the 13th, the day after the, the uh, uh, murders, uh, Whitney, don't forget, is in, in uh, police cells by that point. Harry Roberts calls on John Duddy uh, Saturday morning between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. They walked to Wimington Mansions, uh, ran by uh, Westbourne Park and Harrow Road. This was where the, the van was stashed. No, this was where the, the, the Black Daimler was, because uh, that was Robert's flat. Oh, uh, yeah, something about groceries, blah, blah, blah. I'm just running through a bit here because it's a, it's a bit dull. It's about, you know, prams and babies and groceries, and it kind of doesn't really suit the story. Uh, Duddy was quite shaken up. An hour later, they returned from doing some grocery shopping. Yes, they did some grocery shopping. Um, Robert said that they needed to split up. Duddy only had £3 on him, so Roberts gave him £5 so he could go to Glasgow. Don't forget, Duddy comes from Glasgow, so that kind of makes sense. Um, uh, Robert said uh, that next day, Oh my God, what a mess we've made of things. Uh, Duddy said, Yes, I wish it had never happened. Roberts, we should have burnt the car. See, he's not really that cared about the people he's killed. He's just thinking about himself. We should have burnt the car as it had our fingerprints on it. The police found loads of fingerprints inside the van, uh, as well as loads of stuff that they'd uh, stashed in there as well. Uh, and then they, they decided that they needed to get rid of the guns. So on that Sunday morning, they went to Hampstead Heath. They dug a little hole and they hid the guns inside Hampstead Heath. Uh, Saturday at midnight, uh, the van was discovered. Whitney had uh, organised a, a van under the arches. I haven't written down where the arches is. I probably have somewhere. Um, in there, obviously, the van inside still had the false plates and, you know, the bag and things like that. Um, uh, a young man called William Keeley Jr. Uh, went to visit his father who had rented the arches to Jack Whitney he peered through the slats and he saw a van matching the description which had been on the news and he notified the police police arrived just after midnight forced a lock found the van um, <coughs> before Whitney, Roberts and Duddy could destroy it or even wipe it clean uh what else did they find inside the van? It, I mean, it was full of crap, uh, but inside it was full of bottles, clothes, papers, all covered in their fingerprints. Utter pricks. And I'm sure if you re I'm sure if you read uh, gangster books, gangster, gangster, it all says about, oh, it's flawless. Do you know, oh, they they killed them with swiftness and they drove away into the night. They make it all romantic. But when you look at this, just pricks. Uh, Duddy uh, fled to Glasgow. He was at the Hotel Russell. He booked it uh, for Sunday, the 14th of August, 1966. Um, it was signed in as Mr. and Mrs. J. Crosby. They were in room uh, 749, booked in for two nights. Duddy was arrested in Glasgow on the 17th at 1.20 p.m. DCI Brown of the Glasgow Police uh, saw him, cautioned him. Duddy came quietly, but denied doing the shooting. Duddy, uh, throughout his uh, interroga interrogation, his questioning, ooh, burp, blamed Roberts. He said, it was Roberts who started the shooting, which is true. He shot the two and got out of the car and shouted at me to shoot. I grabbed a gun, ran to the police car and shot the driver through the window. I must have been mad. I wish you could hang me now. Being transferred uh, to and from court, Whitney and Duddy spoke freely to the officers about what had happened. Uh, on the 16th, uh, police went to Harry Roberts' flat, or it was actually really his girlfriend's flat, at 142 Wilmington Road in Paddington, which is just off, just off Elgin Avenue. Inside, they found his fingerprints and a live 38 caliber round found inside the car. Uh, same day, the police found uh, Robert's grey suit that he was wearing inside a bag in the left luggage kiosk at Euston Station. A lot of criminals seem to use the left luggage kiosk at Euston Station. Um, uh, Roberts had actually bought the guns a couple of months prior. He, uh, well, he he got them about a couple of weeks prior because he'd just been released from prison. He got them from, it is said, someone in a cafe on on uh, Shaftesbury Avenue, but we don't know who. Uh, ba 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 ba. Okay. Um, uh, now, um, at this point, you've got Whitney has been arrested. 
Duddy has been arrested. He did go to Glasgow for about three days, but then he was arrested there. He's brought back. Roberts knows this. He sees this in the papers. He panics and he flees. He left, so leaves his clothes at the left luggage kiosk at Euston. Uh, he buys himself some camping equipment and he goes to Epping Forest uh, with Lily, who was his girlfriend at the time. He leaves her there and then he kind of disappears off into a place called Thorley Woods. Uh, and he just basically disappears. Um, he kind of grew up there as a kid. So kind of this area, Thorley Woods, he knows really well. Uh, he knows places to hang out and he knows, you know, because he, he was in the army for years, he knows how to kind of disappear. And basically he does. He disappears for three months. So uh, the trial is starting with Whitney and Duddy. And it actually starts going ahead. It's just that they, they're they like, well, we can't find Robert. So we go ahead with the trial. But they, but they end up, it was around December time. They actually end up having to stop the trial because they capture Robert. So they're like, right, we're going to try them all at the same time. It just makes more sense. So Detective Sergeant Thomas O'Connor, alerted by officers, he went to Thorley Wood. Uh, which is near Thor Thornley Church in Hertfordshire, at about 3 a.m. on Saturday, the 12th of November, 1966, and found a brown-green tent hidden by bracken. He he also found 30 rounds of ammunition for a point uh, a 38 caliber revolver, a homemade holster carrying two pistols, and 30 rounds in a tin. But obviously there was there was no one there. On the 15th of November 1966 at 9.30am a large scale search uh, was uh, st began, I couldn't think of a word then, in and around Bishop Stortford for Harry Roberts. Uh, as the police, there was hundreds of police literally searching every, every kind of place that he could possibly be hiding because they knew he was there somewhere. Uh, they drove to Blount's Farm near Nathan Wood near Sawbridgeworth, where I used to more quite often and they came to a dutch barn uh i'll post some pictures of these on on my instagram account in my instagram uh patreon account where you get some secret pictures and inside they noticed a luger pistol a hand torch a battery a sleeping bag uh <coughs> there's pictures of this as well never been released before they thought the sleeping bag was empty but police sergeant peter smith noticed, noticed a hand and he saw a man's head uh, he identified the person as Harry Roberts. The policeman said, your name is Roberts. Harry said, yes, you won't get any trouble from me. I've had enough. Uh, arrested and cautioned, Harry Roberts said, I'm glad you've caught me. He was escorted to Bishop's Stortford Police Station. He gave a full confession. Uh, he wasn't in his tent, he said, at the time... Uh, when the the original police officer turned up as he felt that he was being followed by the policeman so that's why he went to the uh the big dutch barn and he slept there uh, on the 16th of november uh harry roberts directed the police to the guns he had hidden on hampstead heath uh obviously this is around three months later they were now very rusty and soiled but they were able to prove that these were the guns Whoa. So you can see it's a bit of a cock up there by their by their so-called war fantastic criminals, war gangsters, aren't they brilliant? No, they're not. Uh, there we go. There we go. Right, let's go and do the answers to these questions, and then I can start editing this. Whoa. Whoa. Hopefully, this should be nice and easy. I think, but I always say that, and then it always turns out to be. More complicated. They're getting harder. I think because I'm adding more in. I'm trying to. I'm adding more layers to them. Before, whereas before it'd just be like at the start where you hear the, like the street sounds. Uh, when I go today, well, I'm standing on da da da. All of that, like every single individual sound you hear, is me. Like if you hear bird song, if you hear a car driving past, if you hear a dog barking, if you hear wind blowing, if you hear a church bell in the background, all of that is me. It's not something that i've bought it's something that i sit and create and every sound is leveled and it's right and it's distant and i put i spend ages trying to put the right kind of reverb on it so it, it so you know a church bell in the distant sounds kind of far left but it sounds distant and then a dog barking near might have a little bit of reverb but it's coming from your right speaker and it's you know it's very complicated 
Whew, but now what I'm, and before then sometimes I'd put music in and just kind of time the music to make it fit the, the, the scene that I want. But now I'm starting to layer kind of sounds underneath the music to add a kind of a second resonance to it. So whew, they're getting a lot more complicated. It's taken, I think each episode takes like four days to write, three days to edit. And obviously it's only seven days in a week. Ugh. When am I going to have some days back? <laughs> Anyway, as long as they're good, that's all that matters. That's the important thing. I'd rather I'd rather give you something that I'm really happy with and proud of and that I feel that you kind of listen to and go, oh, I feel like you've given you 100% in there rather than just, you know... I think it's just shameful. I, I, someone tried to befriend me on a, on a Twitter the other day and their their podcast is basically... on the, They'd written... Um, if you have a story, send me your story and I'll add it. I'll, I'll read it out on the podcast. I'm like, you lazy bastard. It's like you, you decided you want to be a podcaster. You can't be asked to do your own. You can't be asked to write a story, do some research, you know, do anything important. You'd rather someone writes to you and then you'll just read it out. I was like, I was like, fuck off. <laughs> it's like, but do you know what? That's the mark of it. Do you know, good. I think good, good quality podcasts will prevail shite will disappear and rightly so <sighs> right although not everyone likes murder mile but there you go right okay answers to the questions if some are missing that's because i've probably edited them out right um question one what was the call sign of the cue car the officers drove answer foxtrot one one Question two. What was the name of the pub the police went to for lunch? Answer. It was the Beaumont Arms Hotel. I said this when I was recording. I said hotel by mistake. I had to redo it. The Beaumont Arms pub on the corner of Wood Lane and uh, Shepherd's Bush Green, which is now called the Defector's Weld, a pub I go to quite a lot. Uh, question three. Uh, what pub did the criminals go to? This is now uh, a regular, quite a, a, a famous music venue, but it was called the Clay Pigeon over in Eastcote. A lot of famous bands played there. Uh, question four. What type of car did the criminals hope to steal? You can do uh, as many layers to this question as you like, uh, but it was a dark blue 1966 Ford Corsair. Well done if you got Ford Corsair, 1960 and or 1966 and or dark blue. <gasps> Ooh, burps. Question five. All three criminals served in the army in which country? Obviously, they served in England, but all three of them served in the same country. Now, Duddy served in Suez, but all three of them served in Malaya. There you go. Uh, question six. Duddy died in which prison? Duddy, 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 Duddy died in which prison? Duddy died in Parkhurst prison. Question seven. Uh, name the type of gearbox used in a Triumph 200. That was the uh, police cue car. It was a Borg Warner. Uh, not a good advert for the Borg Warner people in this episode. Uh, question eight. The criminals drove what type of van? This is a two-part question. And what car couldn't they drive as the brakes were shot? So the van they used in the uh, in the murders, the robbery, was a blue slash white. I'm being kind to them there. Uh, 1952 Standard Vanguard. But the car that they couldn't use, that they wanted to use, was a black Daimler, which was owned by Harry Roberts. Whew. Question nine. Oh, I've got an over overwhelming urge for a Cornish pasty now, and I don't know why. Whew. Question nine. What tattoo did John Duddy have on his right arm? Uh, he had lots of tattoos, but this one was a skull with the words true to death. Twat. <laughs> Why do criminals do that? Why do you? Why do they go and have stupid tattoos? It's just—it's like, 
oh, you, you, you're in a job where you're meant to be a bit clandestine and you, you're meant to blend in and so no one can spot you. But no, you decide to go and get a tattoo which makes you stand out. Why not just get a tattoo on your face that says criminal? It's just utter, really are utter pricks. And this is why people who write these gangster books, oh, it's gangsters, always go, oh, yeah, you had a, oh, you had a really evil tattoo of a, a skull and crossbones with blood. And it's like... Yeah, but if anyone sees that tattoo, he's, he's screwed. Utter idiots. Anyway, question 10. Name the three guns that the criminals used. OK, it was a thirty eight caliber Enfield revolver, a thirty eight Colt Special and a 9mm Luger. Ooh, exciting. So, that's it. That's the end of the show. Oh, God, that was a quite a long extra mile as well, obviously, because we had a lot of stuff to, to report, to report, to say. Anyway, I'm going to get down and edit this, and then I'm going to go to the shops and get some food and things, have a little bit of a walk. Everyone, stay safe, be good, stay healthy, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, I've got some cordial to eat, eat and eat, drink, hopefully... And I'll have a, um, a, a hopefully, uh, I'll have a nice Bakewell tart soon. Ooh, that'd be lovely. I think that counts as essentials. Anyway, hope you're all well. Stay safe. Be good. See, speak to you all. See you all soon, etc., etc. Okay, bye-bye. Bye, 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 bye. You go first. No, you go. No, hang up. Hang on, you go. No, you go. No, you, no, you. Okay, bye. Bye.